In this video, Cornelius Berthold of Dimicator Scola in Hamburg is going to explain to you how to carefully organize your attack in a sword fight so that you don't impale yourself on a sword as you approach your opponent. You will also learn some interesting facts about medieval legislation in regards to learning to fence with sword and butler. Before I'm going to present to you the demonstration of Cornelius Berthold and uh, Simon Peters, which was recorded at the recent Berlin Butler Bouts, I want to say a few words about sword fighting in general, medieval sword fighting that is. There are two basic misconceptions which keep recurring. So the first one is whenever modern people think about sword fighting, medieval sword fighting, they usually envision a pitched battle. Now, the second misconception is that oftentimes I am confronted with the opinion that most people wouldn't have all too much training with a sword or whatever weapon they would use. And that it is uh, the elite, possibly only noble people, who would indulge in training at arms and learn about these refined techniques and uh, sophisticated ways of using medieval weapons as reflected in the late medieval fighting treatises. So I want to read to you a really interesting passage from um, a set of laws which was issued by English King Edward I in 1285. And this concerns security safety within the city walls of the city of London. Now, so uh, from the statutes of the city of London, these be the articles which our Lord the King doth command to be well kept in his city of London for the keeping and maintenance of his peace. First, whereas many evils as murders robberies and manslaughters have been committed heretofore in the city by night and by day, and people have been beaten and evil entreated, and diverse other mischances have befallen against his peace. It is enjoined that none be so hardy to be found going or wandering about the streets of the city after curfew told at St. Martin's Le Grand, with sword or buckler or other arms for doing mischief or whereof evil suspicion might arise, nor any in any other manner unless he be a great man or other lawful person of good repute or certain messenger having their warrants to go from one to another with lanthorn in hand. Okay, so apparently there were loads of people running around with sword and buckler and um, it seems like uh, there was uh, quite a cr crime rate at the time, um, which means that not only the um, robbers or uh, um, those people planning mischief were armed, but uh, you could assume that other people would bear weapons and carry swords too for self-defense, for instance. Now. Um, Here's about closing hour for pubs, apparently not uh, uh, a new thing in England. And whereas such offenders, as aforesaid, going about by night, do commonly resort and have their meetings and hold evil talk in taverns more than elsewhere, and there do seek for shelter, lying in wait and watching their time to do mischief, it is enjoined that none do keep a tavern open for wine or ale after the tolling of the aforesaid curfew, but they shall keep their tavern shut after that hour. Now, you could argue that uh, maybe those people um, who uh, resort in taverns planning mischief sword uh, at their side were probably not very well trained. But here's uh, the final and really interesting passage I want to read to you. Also, for as much as fools who delight in mischief do learn to fence with butler and thereby are the more encouraged to commit their follies, 
It is provided and enjoined that none shall hold school for nor shall teach the art of fencing with buckler within the city by night or by day. If any so do, he shall be imprisoned for 40 days. So here's the historical source that gives us a vivid impression of the reality of bearing arms and using swords in a historical context. And uh, this is a context that is beyond the pitched battle that we usually think of when we think about sword fighting in uh, the Middle Ages. And note also that the art of fencing with sword and buckler, and it is called an art even in this legal text, that this art is being practiced not only by the top strata of society, but also by common people. And uh, there actually were schools for learning the art of fencing with sword and buckler. Now, uh, before he's being imprisoned for 40 days for teaching fencing with the buckler and the sword, you better watch the demonstration by Cornelius Berthold, assisted by Simon Peters, which I'm going to present to you now. Good. So there have been some questions about our blade work, how we uh, position our blades in space uh, in front of the opponent, and why this is sometimes very, um, well, literally up front, very uh, focused in the center, posing uh, very early and uh, very serious threat with a point forward. And we have um, come up with what I call like a spatial planning or geometry, if you will, like a basic layout of how you want to structure the space between you and the opponent um, so that you know where your weapons belong, where the opponent's weapons should be, because this <coughs> is one of the ways you have to sort of bring control, bring order into the uh, chaos of the fight. And you could uh, imagine martial arts to be like an attempt of thinking about how you should structure or bring order to a fight. And this little detail, the spatial detail, is something that I would like to present just now. I'm going to present this, let's say, here in the um, central circle of the hall, this is where uh, Simon will assist me. And uh, a lot of these things are things that you can watch from the side but also from above. So sometimes we will just like kneel down and do it like on, on this level and you are invited to gather in and have a look, a closer look from here because um, those of you who are familiar with our theory about the how uh, Manuscript 133 is using like different um, view planes to convey certain details know that you might not see all the martially relevant details just from the side. Even if you see it like in real life from the side, there might be slight differences. So, um, we talk about a wedge very often, or maybe a cone, and I was just trying to demonstrate what I mean by that. See if can come just closer. This is something, by the way, that works for other weapons as well, not just sort of buckle, but also for rapier or like that's a long sword um, in different ways obviously but I think the basic layer is something that you can get very easily. So if Simon is my opponent, he's standing in front of me, I assume that this space here is the one that is uh, really tricky so I have to take care of that because here on shoulder level he can easily uh, threaten me and he can threaten areas of my body which uh, I would like to keep intact. And so I have to deal with this um, danger here. So, and to cut it short, my idea is that I will defend this space. We called this um, the center um, many years ago, and now it's, uh, at least for me, it is a bit more specific. So what I want to defend is, if, if you, uh, no, you don't have to point, uh, uh, point a line, uh, long point at me, I will just demonstrate. I want to defend something like this like a cone, if you will. So not just a cylinder, it's a cone. It's slightly broader on my side, like you could say, like shoulder-wide, and slightly narrower um, on the opponent's side. And the basic idea is that I don't want any of his weapons to be in there just like that. Unless, of course, it's a special situation, this can happen as well. But on a regular basis, let me give, give me a long point. So I want to lock him out, like from here, 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 or even here. So, this is my space. 
And with weapons, I would basically always make sure that I'm at the uh, position where his blade is. So if he would be moving around with his blade all the time, I would try to keep track of that. So, always here. Uh, one metaphor that I was using is like, um, you can imagine this to be like, like a fence uh, of a garden, and you've got one of these really nasty small dogs who bark all the time. So when, when there are some people going for a walk outside, you have this uh, nasty dog on the inside, it's like, all the time, following them, always barking, totally annoying. I am that nasty little dog. Or let's say the blade is. So because I would always say that if, if he's somewhere here, I would try to lock him out from here. No matter if you have contact at that point or not. Here, here, if he was there, I would sort of keep my blade here. And maybe there might be a chance I'd do this as well. So you might recognize certain um, positions from other weapon systems. Yeah. So, be it like those uh, hanging positions or like those extended like loop or ox positions that you know from longsword or the uh, derivatives uh, from Lang's Messer, which are not totally familiar, or when you're familiar with basic rapier positions, which are like hand motions but not just hand motions, you have very similar ways to defend space. So there is not much explicit mention of this concept of having this geometry. And Maya, for instance, has a wheel, where at least describes this kind of wheel or circle that you have in front of you. But I think it's important to also project this forward. And um, for Sword and Buckler, we figured we mostly need like this lower half of this cone. And if I have both my arms like this, it also like they have this wedge shape, which is why we also talk about uh, wedge. So. Um, what you can see from the side, and we will cover this first, is of course that I want to um, get this blade out of the way also downward. So if I'm moving here, his blade is to the side, you will see that in a moment. But I would also try to make sure that he kind of reach me here. And this is part of the thing where it works better with the buckler. Um, so I don't want him to be a threat from below. So if he goes downwards, there should always be um, the buckler. So we do this in a way that um, even when I can strike my opponent at, in, a, in the head, for instance, with a Zwerchia or something, so when we're in this striking range like this, we try to keep the weapons in a way that if he goes down, he can't reach my belly. And we do this actually as a test. So if you do like a counter and a shield strike, I do a shield strike like this, something like here. We always uh, encourage us to do a test, so he moves the sword under my shield just to see if it's fine, or if I accidentally got too close and he hits me. So, so you have this cover in this lower um, part where you want his weapons to be, if they are somewhere there, to be too low to be actually able to hit you. So, more interesting is how this looks on the horizontal plane. Now I encourage you all to come closer, and we go into into a squad or a kneel. So we have a look at that from the top. So, and obviously this is something you don't easily see in, um, in an illustration, which is basically like a side view. So, my idea here is, so this is my cone, then I have this sort of trapezoid shape, basically. So I'm here at shoulder height and then it goes down. And this means um, the way I try to lock out the opponent's blade is, we can do this with just blade, um, I have this on the right and this on the left. So you can also here imagine the sword is like one line in the, let's say, outer cover of the comb. And the orientation that I'm using is that if I have, we have a bind on the right side, on the outside for rapierists, I imagine more or less a straight line from my shoulder to um, the point, and I'm maybe aiming at his left eye, or from my side, the right eye. The reason is that if my point is getting to the center too early, I'm uh, sliding off his blade. So I mean, he can still work, but there's a bigger chance that I lose this dominance, this superiority. But it also means that on the left side, it should somewhere be on the side where my left arm would be. So in the left side, this is what I'm striving for. 
And this is the slightly counterintuitive thing for people who have never done this. They would assume it's doing something like this. So, but um, I would aim for something like this. Again, going for the eye maybe. And as I always want to keep the buckler in the center, so in order to not produce a large opening here, we end up in this. So, and this is a position that you might notice from the manuscript, even though they don't uh, use the same explanation that I just used. Um, that you do it here, here, you have the shield in the center, and you work in this position. So this would be a, a religatio indexis, or a counterbite on the right. The other thing could be a derivation of uh, Schützen against second ward, or it could be, um, it actually is what we believe uh, the final stage of the Mutatio Gladii on this side. And what I noticed here is, especially at this event, so I was aware of that I'm using this concept just to know, okay, where should my blade be? Um, slightly, let's say, detached from any specific technique. So you can, of course, uh, learn single techniques and know that, okay, I've got a counter to this technique, but this is a more abstract way of thinking which is, of course, very helpful when I have to adapt to situations that I don't know. So, if Simon places his blade somewhere in the space between us, uh, to do like a random position here, so I know it's okay, it's probably to the left, I would probably do something like this and see how, where I can get from there. So, and this helps me a lot against people whom I don't know when fencing, who do something that I wasn't really prepared for, and I always work, uh, work from this um, one of these perspectives and yesterday and even today I had to force myself that when we do any kind of fencing and we have a lot of messing around with the blade I always have to remind myself that I want to get into these positions so this is not satisfying for me something like this would be so and then I'm back in a in a configuration where I know or where I should know uh, what to do but it takes, um, at least for me, it takes a lot of discipline and concentration to force myself to actually come back to these um, uh, blade and facial configurations. And, but then again, if it works somehow, it's very easy to always get back into a position which is very threatening. So I'm safe. So the idea here is it's like, a, like a kettle scoop uh, in front of a locomotive. So, um, uh, if Simon would rush in, it would just go past me here. And um, so I'm safe, I can threaten him, and then I can advance. And if he just pushes me aside, and if he's going to the windscreen white mode, this thing is back here again. Obviously the um, blade um, movement is of course another thing you have to try, especially with a heavy blade. I have a video about that on Facebook already. And in case you're interested, but this is like a basic configuration that I'm using. And that is something that I want to establish before um, closing distance. So and this is another thing, last point that I want to uh, make today. Um, ideally, I want to gain some form of advantage with every kind of step I'm taking, every kind of movement, fencing technique that I'm doing. So um, when you have any kind of bind, I'm advancing and something is happening, like for instance, uh, uh, Simon does a mutatio, as he was told, I'm doing the counterstich. I'm trying to close in a bit. So, I'm trying to take measure away from him. And this means two things. Um, the threat is closer to him. So I'm one step closer to eventually making a hit, for instance. But what's also happening is that um, I've managed to push my defense into the opponent a bit more. So. This is not as, like, say, limiting his options as this is. This means he has to, if he now wants to go around my weapons, for instance, it's a much larger way than if he does the same thing here, for instance, where he's still in front of my buckler. And if you remember the, uh, the little uh, fencing games we did as warm-up, where I said you gradually work yourself into the opponents, this is how I would, um, if I do everything correctly, of course, how I would do the same thing with weapons, like always exploiting, exploiting my opponent's ideas, uh, uh, mistakes, uh, always trying to gain more measure. And this feels step by step like uh, pulling a noose tight, basically. Mm. Like limiting options or um, uh, creating a Zwickmühle in German. Is there an English term for that? 
probably. Nine bit horrors, probably. <laughs> <laughs> we will get a subtitle for that. Um, so it's like step by step, limiting the options, pushing my defense into the opponent, as I call it. So the uh, hit eventually should be inevitable. So uh, if, I've, if I've done everything correctly, then I do hit and it's controlled and it's perfect and everything is nice. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, what you can take from Italian record, for instance, is term stringere. Uh, apparently, if I'm not mistaken, it actually comes from strangle. So and I like this word because it also implies this kind of taking away options, or, uh, making it much, ever more difficult for the opponent to get out of this. And I think this approach is something that can make your fencing uh, safer, not just from the mechanical point of view, but also from what you're trying to achieve. So, because I mean, all of us still sometimes see an opening and think, okay, we just go into the opening. But embedding this kind of thing in this controlled, um, spatially and also rhythmically controlled environment is probably something that is um, intended in the, in the sort of martial systems that we have. Are there any questions about this? Critique. Um, could you could you um, show the how you actually bridge distance using that when you talk about um, choking or uh, limiting options? How because you need to you need to bridge distance to actually get into striking range. And you were talking that you actually get closer mm -hmm. so that uh, he has less options or has to move more extensively. Could you uh, actually give us an impression how you do that? We, we can give an example, absolutely. One uh, fundamental thing that we use to avoid giving the opponent a tempo through a step. So doing like an, um, uh, a, a reckless leap forward or something is that our um, steps that we take are supposed to look like this. Mm -hmm. so, and they're designed like this um, so that we can initiate a step, but we don't move our body. So we, the idea is that we don't have a tempo by doing something like this. When we move our body, we still have both of our feet on the ground, so we can do it like this. There is no like um, floating stage like this, for instance. And then if we have done what we want to do in this tempo, we have decided for a sword action, we did a sword action, then of course we finish the step. But at this point we already have moved our body and we just make sure we're back in our um, fencing position again. So this is just as a prerequisite. Um, I would demonstrate this with the right counterbite, uh, which should um, finish in a shield strike and in a trash house. And, um, but we'll probably deal with what could happen in between. So, um, but I will still demonstrate this over by shield strike first. So, Simo is getting the first ward. I'm threatening with half shield. He is getting over by. I'm trying to get an overbind like this. Do my step. Get a shield strike so he can't initially move his shield. And get a trash out here at the side of the head. Could you please repeat exactly that again? Okay. So ideally, yeah, we do the measure test, and luckily it worked for me. So, <laughs> as if I had done it before. Um, <laughs> so now, of course, the crucial thing is what happens if there's something um, coming in between from his side. And this is now where we try to um, uh, have the sort of cautionary advancing. So if nothing happens, you see what I did was advance, and in the end I can, let's say, finish with a shield strike. So we have a look at that one more time, just to see what happens. So um, I have the uh, upper hand, so my, my blade is on top. And my blade is sort of uh, on this um, outer cone um, trajectory, if you will. And then I go here. So at this point, his options are very limited. If he does a very late a cavazione, for instance, uh, the shield is already in the middle. And the way I take my step should allow me to just simply redirect and uh, follow the blade. So if he wants to disengage, and do Mochazio Gladi, he has to do it very early. So, and it should look something like this. So I'm starting here, and he does that 
uh, in a moment where his play is still free, so he can still do it. So, and what he ideally will do is, once he has uh, gained the advantage, um, he will, let's say, extend his weapons and try to take space from me. So I will try to like push this forward, and if he's too early with his Mutatsu Gladii, he will do the same thing against me and threaten my face. So I will do it like this. Sorry, now we, so, and now I, basically I have the same problem now. If I want to do something like this, the weapon's are already in the way. So we try to take each other's, um, let's say, safe space, if you will, so we take each other's measure um, to proceed. And to wrap this up, uh, the counter against the Mutatio, uh, this uh, Stich, according to the manuscript, um, would be basically doing the same thing. So if you do this in very slow motion, would be cross. So I try to gain measure, he goes out, he tries to gain my measure, I'm countering it, bring my weapons forward, and again now I have taken his space, and I could of course then finish the step and hit him. Could you do it again? So, so in all of these cases, the positions that we arrive in are somewhat related to um, this cone, it's like this in the Ligatio, it's like this after the Mutatio, and I go from the Religatio to the Stich, and it should again be on this side, Meaning on the right side of this cone or mesh or whatever. So, and this is combined with a way of stepping that allows me to um, uh, redirect things. For instance, if he doesn't cut, so I can apply a counter counter to that as well. Does it make sense? Yes, but uh, could you also explain why you think that this step uh, actually allows you to rearrange um, or adapt to a change in situation? Um, it's two things. It's um, first uh, the properties of the step that I mentioned earlier. For instance, I don't have like a um, like a floating section in between where I can't really redirect. So it's very. I think we only can agree on if I have this kind of step. It's very hard to now take it back again. It just doesn't work. Because you carry all the weight of the body with carry that on. Yeah, I'm in a, in, a, in a moving position. Mm. So, um, so this is why we try to avoid these at all costs. Um, another more subtle thing is um, that I'm slightly, uh, I have a, like a temporal offset to blade and foot actions, if you will. So the, um, if you just look at what, what I'm doing here, uh, the Deligatio Indexis um, is blade action. I initiate the step. Now the blade remains static. Where, where is that? If there's a Montatio Gladii, I'm sort of in the step where nothing happens, and react with the blade again, and do a step. So, strictly speaking, and this is all like in theory, so if you do it really perfectly, um, we always have blade and foot motions after one another, and I'm not doing like this at the same time. So, and incidentally, this is also mentioned in this um, uh, C13 manuscript that was uh, recently edited by um, Rainer van Norden and Jan Schäfer, um, which is in a fabulous uh, rapier tradition. Um, very, very nice book, a very fine granularity of thinking about all these details. And he also says, uh, if I remember correctly, something like, um, <coughs> so you never do like a sword action and a foot action simultaneously. So you always have like a slight offset between them. Or you do it, one after the other. And this basically can be a very... Uh, it's, it's not getting much simpler, admittedly, but it sort of gives you kind of a freedom that you don't have to bother with two things simultaneously. They do come one after the another, uh, one after another very quickly though, uh, but basically you just do like plate, foot, plate, foot, something like that. And I use this in my footwork, so we have like, if we do basic steps forward, uh, sometimes it's, Tell the people that they do like one blade action at the end of the step, uh, one action at the beginning of the step, one at the end, and so on, because ideally you should be able to react to all of these stages in a step. But that's just a side note. Any more questions? 
Yeah. Uh, when you point your butler, he told us uh, to leave it in the center. Mm -hmm. But uh, do you point it as his like solar plexus or as his sword arm? Or... I mean, we, we do have um, the buckler extended in a way which is as natural as with the <coughs> with this sort of relaxed grip or precision grip, as Wikipedia calls it, like German Wikipedia. And so it's for something like this, and I adjust it then according to the side where the blade is. Um, in general terms, we try to keep it uh, on shoulder height unless we do something clever. So, um, it's also something I noticed this weekend that I'm very lazy with my own personal buckler work. It always drops and then people hit me on the head. But ideally, the thing is, we always leave it here and then work around the face. It's very interesting, and now that you mention it, when you are um, teaching thrusts, uh, because some of the thrusts that are not I mean, like the one I just did, but also the ones that come from 5th ward or 6th ward, where you uh, rotate the buckler like this. This is always tempting people to, let's say, rotate the sword around the shield, and not vice versa. So, if you do it like this, obviously, you have a um, the blade on the left side of your cone, but what is the problem? Your blade is still, your yeah, blade still, blade is still on the right side, it means it can, can point directly at my face. So, these things as well should be trained that they are on the outside. And basically, this position is the exception that you're using for, uh, for thrusts, otherwise it's like here. But yeah, then extend it naturally like this, a bit with the hilt of the, uh, of the grip of the shield pointing forward. So, but it's, I would say it depends. Like many things in martial arts, it always depends. Um, but holding it forward so that I have an idea of where it's pointing. In the right overbind, um, try to point over the opponent's weapons, but this is just a detail, we can uh, cover this at a later point. Thank you. Any other questions? Critique? Doubt? <laughs> okay, then, thank you for your attention. <laughs>